uh, present this topic today. Uh, we'll look at the agenda. Uh, we'll start with uh, application level security, what application layer is, what uh, layer seven is. Uh, a little bit of information about Istio and service mesh, like Raj pointed out, you know, what's the deal with uh, service mesh and, uh, you know, sidecars and all that with uh, containers. Um, and do you really need a service mesh to, uh, you know, help with uh, security and observability for containers? Uh, there is a demo in the end, but uh, it's not going to be the full-fledged demo with everything that is spoken about because it, it 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 might take a very long time, and I'm probably not the right person to do it. I know I'm currently not, uh, you know, hands-on with technical stuff, but uh, I'll I'll try to do my best with, you know, showing how Calico can be installed. What uh, uh, what's the, you know, the nuts and bolts of uh, the solution. So we'll start with application level uh, security and, uh, you know, get to the basics of what uh, application layer is, OSI or the OSI uh, model and so on. But before that, since we are dealing with containers and Kubernetes for today, uh, I just want to give a very brief introduction to uh, Containers. I, I'm not sure how many people are familiar with it, but let's you know just look at uh, on a very high level uh, what containers are. Um, I, I'm sure that most of you are familiar with VMs and you know, virtual machines uh, running on ESXi and so on. But uh, you know what's the deal about containers? Uh, people talk about Docker's containers, Kubernetes. So what what do these things mean? Um, so when you look at uh, the you know the simple architecture of a virtual machine you see that uh, it has a has the infrastructure all the physical components of uh, you know the the uh, hypervisor the ESXi servers and so on uh, it has a uh, has an host operating system and on top of that runs the hypervisor to you know, enable virtualization and you have different VMs so if you look at the red pillars app one app two and app three imagine app one with the the binaries and the libraries and the guest OS that forms the uh, uh, typical virtual machine. So you have, you know, three VMs uh, shown here. Uh, it's a very you know high level logical diagram, but uh, that's what VMs are. It it shares uh, uh, the host operating system and the hypervisor uh, piece, but it has a guest OS running on every machine. So uh, it, it actually requires a lot of resources when you look at it. When you when you look at uh, the virtual machine itself and how each uh, VM has to run a guest OS on that, and quickly look at the right side of the diagram where you look at containers and you notice there is a small difference that uh, the containers don't have any guest operating system on it. So it it makes it much more efficient in terms of resources. It doesn't. Uh, take up that many resources. So, I mean, to put it a very uh, uh, you know, simple definition, containers, imagine containers to be lightweight forms of uh, virtual machines, where uh, it just shares the, the OS kernel with other containers, but uh, doesn't have any type of, you know, uh, guest operating system on its own. Um, <clears throat> of course it does, uh, uh, come with all the binaries and libraries that's needed for uh, running a container. And uh, that's that's basically it. Um, and it's also running as isolated processes in the user space uh, on the host operating system. Yeah. Um, and there is also another you know logo right in front of the container uh, uh, you know logical diagram here. Uh, uh, if if you're familiar with that, uh, then you'll probably be interested in uh, the the you know the future slides that are going to come up. Uh, so that's basically Kubernetes, and uh, so Docker uh, started the whole process of uh, orchestrating containers using Docker Swarm, and uh, before that, it was you know up to the user end user to use any type of you know, inbuilt or uh, in-house solution for orchestrating containers because uh, the way containers are built, it, it's uh, it's a very complex system. There has to be you know, uh, hundreds and thousands of containers running for an application and uh, 
it was very hard to manage these containers. So uh, Docker came up with a solution to, initially they, come, they came up with the solution to prepare containers for runtime and so on. But, uh, you know, just with the orchestration part, it was it was kind of difficult, and then uh, back in twenty around twenty fourteen, sometime uh, Google uh, already had their own you know version of Kubernetes running uh, in their data center. Uh, it was it wasn't uh, out in the open yet. Uh, they were just using it as a in house project, and then looking at how useful it was, they uh, launched it uh, in the open and became an open source project and they donated it to CNCF, which is the Cloud Native Compute Foundation. Uh, and, you know, people started using Kubernetes uh, uh, and right now it's probably the most uh, adopted <coughs> container orchestration uh, tool there is. Um, so, I mean, even though Kubernetes is open source, what people did was, uh, uh, you know, companies like Red Hat, uh, AWS, and Azure, these folks uh, took Kubernetes and, uh, you know, put kind of some some kind of a wrapper around it. Even, you know, if you've not heard of Rancher, they're, they're another uh, uh, managed Kubernetes service. Uh, I'm sorry, self-managed Kubernetes service, which is more like private cloud. And uh, what they did was made it easier for people to use Kubernetes. Uh, Kubernetes made it easy to maintain containers and, uh, you know, uh, uh, secure and uh, control the container behavior. But then uh, all these services like uh, Rancher and Red Hat OpenShift, they made it easy for people to use Kubernetes. <clears throat> all right, so let's look at, uh, you know, application layer security and observability. Uh, so by default, Kubernetes doesn't offer any type of uh, security uh, for the application. I mean, there, there is definitely some kind of security that is part of the Kubernetes uh, platform itself uh, with respect to all the control plane components of Kubernetes. But uh, when you are building an application, it doesn't uh, know anything about the workloads or the containers running within your application. Uh, sorry. Yeah. I'm seeing some kind of a message. Okay. Let's say Q and A. You go ahead, Agri. Uh, no issue. Yeah, go yeah, ahead. yeah. Um, so, uh, so for this talk, we'll just focus on, uh, you know, how application layer security and observability uh, uh, matters for Kubernetes and containers. Uh, there's a lot of stuff to talk about, but uh, you know, why we focus on application layer is because you know, any type of service that's, that's running in microservices, uh, it's actually handled uh, uh, on this layer. And uh, there is no um, default, uh, you know, method or uh, component of Kubernetes that can handle this. Um, so if people are not familiar, some of you might not be familiar with uh, the OSI model, with this, this is like you know basics of networking going back to uh, what uh, the OSI model is uh, you could do a you know if you're interested you could do a Google search and read more about this but um, the OSI model basically talks about the different uh, seven layers of uh, networking um, if you if you if you're curious what happens when you you know type in a, a domain address on your browser uh, you could actually go through each and every layer on this model and uh, you know explain to someone how internet works basically. Uh, so that's that's uh, the concept of the OSI model. And what you uh, see on the topmost layer is the application layer, uh, and this is the layer where uh, you know I'm sure everyone here knows about HTTP, and uh, the, the, that's the protocol that's uh, part of the uh, layer seven. And uh, that's what we are interested in. When we say application layer or application level, we're talking about layer seven and HTTP uh, in this case, because in microservices, that's the most common uh, type of communication that happens within services. And uh, I mean, there, there could also be a situation where these services use uh, HTTPS, which is you know uh, secure uh, HTTP, but most likely it's still HTTP. And uh, these services, they actually, what they do is they invoke a, a web API 
uh, request. Uh, and uh, it's based on the HTTP protocol. Uh, and like I said, the problem is, you know, uh, when you look at uh, the service level communication, it's all about monitoring and understanding what's going on between these different services within your application. Uh, 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 and I mean, folks, if you're interested in knowing more about microservices and containers and all these, it's it's not an abstract concept anymore. People are already using it in production. Uh, most websites, most uh, apps these days, I mean, any think about a banking app, a financial app, think about your insurance application, all these are probably running containers uh, and probably managed by Kubernetes. Uh, uh, I, I don't want to give a very specific example because uh, you might not know these businesses, but uh, you know, just uh, think about Visa, the credit card service. So that they're probably running Kubernetes and uh, they've been uh, you know using uh, microservices for a long time. So these uh, technologies are. Uh, matured enough, but uh, the problem with security and observability are not up to that level of adoption because you know they people just want to get the application out running, but are still you know learning uh, things about security uh, in the market. <clears throat> so what? Oh, sorry. <clears throat> uh, so what kind of uh, observability challenges uh, does Kubernetes pose? So one is data collection and correlation. Uh, the problem with microservices is you have a huge amount of data uh, compared to a, a monolith application. Uh, if you look at a containerized application, the, the, just the amount of log data is just humongous. And uh, the other problem with large amount of data is also correlation. So how do you understand uh, which flow log belongs to which workload, which uh, you know uh, HTTP response code uh, corresponds to which container? Because these containers are running in the hundreds and thousands, mm -hmm. and they also you know restart. Uh, I'll, I'll get to that later, but you know the whole thing about Kubernetes is that. Uh, it's designed in a way that if something goes wrong with your uh, container or let's say pod, so pod is actually, you know, uh, I'm, I'm bringing in too many uh, terminologies, but uh, stay with me. And if you have any questions, please post it on q and I'll pause my recording and look at it. Sorry, pause my presentation and look at the uh, questions. Uh, so pod is actually a Kubernetes component, which is the smallest unit of uh, I would say smallest unit within a Kubernetes uh, uh, environment. And uh, typically a pod will have one or two containers or a you know, couple of containers running within a pod. Um, and, you know, I'll uh, uh, use pods or workloads uh, interchangeably so it all means the same. Um, and correlation between all these data is just, you know, really difficult. Uh, and also aggregation of these data. I mean, you cannot just randomly uh, uh, present the user with a ton of uh, alerts and then you know ask them to go figure it out. Uh, so that is that is a challenge. And uh, also, you know, when I said Kubernetes context, uh, it adds Kubernetes adds a layer of abstraction uh, on top of the host or the VMs. Uh, so while collecting and aggregating data from individual containers. Uh, the data needs to be correlated and aggregated at different levels of uh, abstractions. Uh, there's one more challenge. Uh, how do you uh, map Kubernetes policies to traffic flow in real time? Because when you look at security, I mean, uh, it has gone to a point where uh, the the operations security operations team are you know looking at a ton of alerts like probably a big enterprise like Visa uh, is probably looking at almost 10,000 alerts per day or even per hour. Uh, so you need a, a mechanism to uh, map these uh, policies, network policies to traffic flow. And uh, by default, you don't get that with Kubernetes. So this is also a, a huge challenge. Uh, 
Um, I mean, just when, when you look at, you know, the teams involved with uh, uh, handling communities and containers, uh, the challenge really is actually looking at service to service uh, uh, visibility. So one is it's a distributed architecture and uh, it runs, communities can run applications across multiple nodes and it's very difficult to monitor and track them. Uh, you also need a granular level of visibility, and you cannot, you know, just say that uh, packet is going from uh, this node to that node without any context of, you know, what the timestamp or the, uh, you know, the, the other details of the uh, particular flow. Uh, you need you need much more uh, granular level of context within the community's workflows itself. And of course, I said it's a dynamic environment. Uh, when when I, when I say dynamic, imagine a uh, pod is uh, you know involved in the application and sending out traffic. Something goes wrong, and then the pod is restarting. You need to have the his historical uh, data log data from a pod that is uh, you know being restarted, and also the new pod. So all this you know combined with the other things that I've been talking about makes it really difficult for. Uh, a user to understand what's going on. Uh, and uh, also, I mean, when I said Kubernetes by default uh, does not have any uh, features, so just using the native form of Kubernetes, vanilla Kubernetes will not give you any built in tools for monitoring or troubleshooting. Uh, you won't have packet capture, you will not have uh, you know, any dashboards, you're just presented with a, a blank screen with, you know, a couple of kubectl commands at your disposal. And uh, it's up to the user to find their own method of, uh, you know, troubleshooting all these uh, problems. Uh, there are some built-in metrics and logs, but uh, I mean, for a real world scenario, I don't think those are uh, uh, useful. <clears throat> Let me pause here. Uh, if you have any questions so far, please feel free. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm not an expert in this field, so if I'm not able to answer any of the questions, I'll definitely you know, uh, take it to my team and uh, come back with answers if it's really something that, that you're interested in. Uh, uh, but feel free to ask questions. So uh, you looked at the challenges. Uh, you will look at the solution, but then what what prompted people prompted these uh, you know uh, people to come up with solutions? What 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 do you actually need for uh, solving these problems with security and observability? So one, you would need flow logs, uh, basic. You have to have you know information of uh, layer seven traffic, which is you know it could be any type of layer seven flow data. It can be uh, start time and end time of the uh, uh, packet. And flow it could be a number of bytes in and bytes out uh, and within you know when we talk about communities and containers it's also important uh, to know the source and destination uh, namespace of a particular uh, flow and uh, i've just uh, introduced another term for you which is namespace uh, so namespace is a Kubernetes specific uh, term that they use and uh, think of namespace as a you know, a logical group of uh, resources that perform some kind of work within an application. So just imagine an online retail store, you know, like Amazon or something, uh, and uh, they have a checkout service, they have a product catalog service. So these, imagine the product catalog and checkout as, you know, uh, namespaces. Um, also, what the uh, typical, uh, a suggestion with Kubernetes is if you're starting out with just you know a few couple of users, don't use a lot of you know, don't use more than one namespace. Start with the default, and based on the complexity and scale of your application, you can start creating users. I mean, namespaces typically are used when you have multiple users managing the application, developing the application. So that's that's the uh, uh, fundamental reason for uh, the concept of namespaces. 
so the second thing that you need for security and observability is policies. So without policies, you cannot, you know, some kind of uh, security policy, you cannot uh, block or allow or deny or drop packets at layer seven. Uh, so you need some kind of policies and Kubernetes policies, the network policies that Kubernetes has is super basic and you cannot do much with that. It doesn't uh, offer a, a fine grained access at all. Um, and uh, when you look at uh, security itself, you have to have protection against, uh, you know, the application layer threats. Uh, I'm sure I introduced the concept of, you know, HTTP and all that, but uh, if you've heard of, uh, uh, you know, things like SQL injection or cross-site scripting and uh, you know, cookie poisoning, all these happen at the application layer. And uh, someone who has, you know, even just uh, no other tools in their, uh, uh, you know, um, at their disposal, but just has access to your uh, internet facing application with just your web page, they can probably create, uh, you know, things and, uh, Kind of uh, infiltrate your uh, application with all these things that I spoke about, you know, the SQL injection and cross-site scripting and so on. Just with a couple of form fills or some kind of a, a page where you have, let's say, a username password field. If your uh, application developer has not been careful enough to, uh, uh, you know, develop, uh, look at all the security and threat modeling while creating the application, you would. Uh, for sure you're going to get breached. Uh, so you need something at the application. So these happen at layer seven and you need some kind of protection uh, against these attacks. And uh, uh, OWASP top 10 is actually, so OWASP is a, is a nonprofit uh, uh, community, which actually has a list of, uh, you know, top 10 threats when uh, looking at application layer. And uh, I would encourage you to, uh, go to that website and understand what these uh, attack means. So they keep refreshing their uh, top 10 every year. Uh, I think I have a couple of questions. Uh, let me look at the... I don't want to bore everyone with just talking nonstop. So I think I'll just take a break and look at the questions. Uh, so one person is asking to what extent is AI implemented to provide solution for proactive issues? Uh, I'm sure this is, um, you know, coming from all the news about chat GPT and all the, you know, machine learning and AI that's happening. So a lot of security solutions are actually doing machine learning. I don't know if AI can be, uh, you know, it can be relevant here. Uh, uh, it's probably a long way to go in that uh, aspect. So there are uh, a lot of solutions which use machine learning. It's not, uh, you know, it's not something that uh, uh, hasn't started yet. Uh, but AI, I'm, I'm not sure about that. I don't think we are at a stage where there is any concept of AI with security and observability. Um, or even anything to do with containers, any any type of uh, you know, enterprise applications. Uh, one more question or comment is application to application communication is mostly API HTTP is driven. Can't these be monitored? Uh, I mean, when when you just talk about, uh, <clears throat> uh, I, I mentioned this uh, thing about monolith. So monolith is uh, uh, again. I'm just assuming that some folks in the meeting not, are not familiar with it. So monolith is the traditional way of building applications. It's the exact opposite of containerization. And in, in, in a monolith application, I think doing monitoring for HTTP uh, uh, communication is probably easy, or uh, I can say it has been figured out. You have uh, solutions to do that. But <clears throat> my uh, point was specifically about containers and Kubernetes. Uh, it's not the problem is not because you can't build a solution or people don't know how HTTP works within containers and communities. It's just getting all the information, uh, you know, uh, putting it in a, uh, 
a system where it's going to give you a clean output and context-based output of what you exactly have to look at. Uh, and that's the reason why it's not, uh, it's not easy. <clears throat> if my application is protected behind WAF, do I need to take any additional measures? So, uh, so that's an excellent question. Uh, I'm glad you asked about WAF. Uh, I was just talking about uh, application layer threats and OAP top 10. So web application firewall, WAF is web application firewall and uh, you can actually uh, protect your application with a WAF, but again, uh, you know, the whole uh, landscape of containers and Kubernetes is so different and people are still understanding the service-to-service -service communication that uh, I'll just provide some answers with respect to WAF. So, Typically, when you uh, deploy a WAF or a web application firewall, you put it at the perimeter. So imagine you're developing a cloud native application and you're putting this WAF uh, at, at the perimeter. And when I say perimeter, I have to you know, give you some context about what perimeter is with respect to Kubernetes. So uh, I'm just gonna quickly, maybe I think I, I can show you a, a a visual representation of what a Kubernetes cluster means. Uh, so if you go to the Kubernetes uh, web page, <clears throat> it has uh, something called Kubernetes components. Uh, this is a very good starting point to understand what uh, Kubernetes is all about. So you see this, there is, so this whole gray uh, box, that's a Kubernetes cluster. So the things that I spoke about, pods and nodes, all these uh, reside within the cluster. Uh, and to set context for a cluster, let's say, you know, you're building a, a, a new application, let's say you're building the next Instagram. Uh, I would say for a company like that, you would probably need just one cluster uh, to start with. And based on scale, you might want to you know, add one more cluster. So cluster is actually a very high level concept in Kubernetes. So everything within a cluster is all part of the microservice uh, architecture. So um, where was I? I was talking about uh, web application firewall and perimeter. So when you think of a WAF, a traditional WAF, like let's say Imperva or uh, uh, any other WAF, you, you're putting it at the perimeter where it has information about traffic leaving the cluster and entering the cluster, but what happens within the cluster that is you know, communication between microservices, it is oblivious to it. It has no idea what is going on. And if, you, if you're familiar with how you know, threats propagate within, uh, within an application, if you've heard of lateral movement, your WAF is not going to catch that. Uh, so let's say a malicious actor is, has uh, entered your uh, application and they are doing some kind of activity where there is a part of it where you know it's at the application layer and they are sending a, a packet with the HTTP header that is not uh, you know meant to uh, which is which is not meant to be part of the application. So that is when a web application firewall that is built just for containers and communities will help. And that is why you cannot use a regular WAF. Of course, it, it, it's a good question. You can use a WAF for, you know, it's better to use a WAF on the perimeter, but you need some kind of a solution that can understand, you know, traffic within, which sits within the cluster and understands uh, or uh, inspects service-to-service uh, -service, uh, communication. Um, how do you manage customer data protection while implementing flow logs? In a multi tenant cloud service. So, oh, another good question. Um, there is, uh, you'll, I'll, I'll probably uh, cover that in the next few slides. So, with um, Calico's implementation, so Calico is, you know, the solution that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, that's the uh, solution that we offer from Tigera. It's, it's a open source uh, solution which uh, started as a, uh, you know, networking and security solution, and we built you know, uh, multiple things on top of that. But with Calico, uh, when you, uh, uh, when, when you're talking about application layer uh, uh, things, uh, one way what we've, what we've done is uh, we've used a efficient model of implementing Envoy as a daemon set. I know I'm getting ahead of my topic, but uh, 
you can actually do you can actually encrypt uh, uh, flow uh, you know traffic at layer seven using Envoy. So that's what I was going to talk about. So uh, there is an open source uh, project called WireGuard, and we've integrated with WireGuard in Calico, and you can actually just it's it's actually much easier than other types of uh, encryption where you don't need to deal with uh, certificates and uh, keychains and all that. It's just a simple way of enabling and disabling encryption at layer seven. So I don't know if I've answered your question correctly, but if you're talking about you know data encryption, that's one way to do. <laughs> what policies are required at application layer? So that's what we're going to cover. Uh, uh, I know you're super excited to uh, look at policies, but we'll we'll uh, cover that in the next uh, couple of slides. I'll I'll get to. All right. Uh, yeah, that's about it. Uh, thanks for the questions. It was uh, actually, you know, it's very useful for me to understand the, the different types of questions that uh, you guys came up with. So appreciate it. And please feel free to uh, post more. Uh, so we spoke about application layer threats and OS top 10. Uh, so the other, uh, you know, uh, type of threat that is common with uh, any type of application is DDoS, which is uh, distributed denial of service. Uh, so put it in, uh, again, if you're not familiar with the DDoS attack, uh, I don't know how many of you grew up in the 2000s when email was hot and People spoke about email bombs where you could send someone, if you hated someone, you could just send them uh, an email bomb, which has about 10,000 or 20,000 emails and there uh, <laughs> the server will crash and they'll probably not get an email. Uh, so I, I know it's a bad example, but something that's uh, something that's very similar to DDoS attacks. Uh, someone who does not like your company organization is trying to you know, bring it down, they can, uh, send uh, you know uh, a ton of uh, HTTP requests uh, to your application and you know bring the app down. So that's basically a very uh, high level uh, explanation for what a DDoS is. And uh, this also happens at layer seven. When say HTTP request, obviously it happens at layer seven, and you need some kind of protection to uh, uh, at least detect if a DDoS attack is gonna happen. Uh, and interestingly, uh, I'm just you know not sticking to the slide itself, but uh, I was reading an article about uh, uh, how Google's security team actually prevented a DDoS attack last year, which was, you know, it, it, it set a record for the amount of requests uh, that came in. So they actually had a Google Cloud customer uh, who looked at uh, you know some weird uh, uh, communication within the network and Google immediately alerted them and they actually saw the spike of requests that went above you know above forty million uh, requests. So uh, that it's a very interesting uh, topic in itself and how it's interesting how uh, you know these. Uh, security solutions like some some uh, providers actually combine WAF with uh, DDoS and it's pretty common to see both offered by the same company. So yeah, uh, uh, with Calico, what happens is you can actually look at a particular uh, layer seven field. Uh, I, I guess it's called the HTTP request spike. Uh, that we uh, collect the data about, and uh, you know, any any time this uh, this uh, graph goes high, uh, the the request spike is uh, above a particular level. You, you can you can actually get alerted and uh, uh, assume there is going to be a DDoS attack, and you know, take preventive measures. <clears throat> so that's another uh, security challenge, or, or you know, things that you need. And finally, just visibility into service-to-service -service communication. Uh, when when I say uh, visibility, it could mean a couple of things for different things for different people. But uh, you know, one one great aspect is um, uh, you know actually looking at how your uh, nodes and clusters and namespaces are. I mean, all these are 
I, I showed you the diagram in uh, the Kubernetes website, but then when you actually uh, start building applications with containers, there is no UI, uh, there is no visualization of how these things look. I mean, you probably don't have an idea about uh, the mapping between different services. So that is a, a problem when it comes to visibility. And also, you know, looking at actual visibility itself in terms of traffic communication, we, we saw all the challenges that are present in Kubernetes. So uh, yeah, so that's that's about all the you know things that are needed. And uh, you know, another byproduct of uh, having a good visibility solution or observability solution is looking at performance. Uh, we spoke about security and observability, but again, you can use this for observability, you can use this for performance uh, issues where you can look at uh, latency, you know, DNS latency and uh, you know, any type of uh, HTTP uh, errors or, you know, a lot of data that you can look at to see how your uh, application is performing. Uh, this is, I think, very useful for DevOps and SRE teams where they are, uh, uh, you know, required to uh, see or uh, make sure that the application performs well. <clears throat> Um, I think I might have another question. When you said within Kubernetes, it's difficult to monitor threats. Can SIMS or help in identifying or aggregating those data? Um, so a SIM or a SOAR will, uh, SOAR cannot identify any, I mean, sometimes I think it can, but uh, SIM definitely, um, even though they might not require, uh, you know, uh, context about the, container itself, what uh, solutions, typically what uh, the solutions use, like even Calico, we actually export data from our uh, solution over to a SIM. So I think uh, a SIM can have its own, uh, you know, style of uh, uh, identifying data or, you know, looking at uh, threats or any type of uh, issues. So uh, it's, it's a good question again, and uh, it is, uh, you know, an additional level of uh, uh, threat identification that you can use. So uh, you can use some and so, but it is not uh, sufficient to just you know plug in a SIM solution within your Kubernetes uh, environment. Uh, it it will not be able to. So it, since it doesn't sit in the same uh, level as the infrastructure, it doesn't sit in the infrastructure level. That is, it doesn't understand Kubernetes, uh, uh, you know, concepts. So it's difficult to correlate data, which a solution that Calico can do and then export logs to SIM. So we, we basically partner with a lot of uh, SIM and SOAR companies to uh, help with uh, getting data. <clears throat> can you please share any links which describe more about how GCP provide DDoS? Uh, let me find out to maybe towards the end of the presentation, but if you just Google for, you know, uh, DDoS attack, Google Cloud, you'll probably get that uh, result. But yeah, I'll, I'll try to get that uh, towards the end of the uh, session. We talked about operational aspects. Okay, sorry, I need to uh, repeat the question out loud because others cannot uh, hear it. Uh, so the first question was about when you said within Kubernetes, it's difficult to monitor threats, can SIEM or SOAR uh, uh, help in identifying or aggregating those data? So that was answered. And then link about the GCP example that I gave about DDoS attack, that is the second one. The third one is you have talked about the operational aspects of managing Kubernetes security. Can you touch upon how security postures in Kubernetes clusters can be audited? particularly in light of its ephemeral nature? Uh, that's a very good question. So if, if you're talking about uh, you know, compliance, I, I'm assuming that's what uh, the question is about. Uh, compliance is actually very hard with these solutions because uh, if you ever work with uh, aud auditing and policies, uh, auditing and uh, uh, compliance, what they would, some of them would require is, you know, historical data. And 
if you go tell them that hey my pod installed so i cannot give you that information you are going to you know either going to cancel your uh, compliance or you are not you will not be allowed to uh, run your business so we actually uh, uh, so calico by default doesn't offer that but uh, you know if you uh, look at uh, our enterprise solutions they do offer some kind of uh, uh, compliance uh, you know uh, solution so it is actually very difficult to uh, do it if you don't have the right tools and you're absolutely right i mean to get the contextual data about uh, which pod has been started what data uh, you know it, it was carrying and all that uh, <clears throat> uh you can actually so there are a couple of things one is compliance like gdpr hipaa and eci uh, so what you would need is a regular reporting uh, facility that will give you you know uh, detailed reports either by the hour or the day week months so on and uh, you know you need to have some kind of customization within the reports itself you cannot you know just rely on basic reports and you need to probably uh, middle around with some of the customization like uh, the the time range or even you know the type of data that you want and the other type of uh, security posture audit is uh, about you know i spoke about the kubernetes control plane and uh, if if this control plane is not hardened security hardened uh, you'll obviously have uh, you know threat actors attacking your uh, infrastructure uh, or your platform and you so there is a concept of uh, concept called kspm which is kubernetes security posture management uh, very similar to a cspm which is cloud security posture management uh, so kspm has you know you, you can again get uh, reports uh, telling you how uh, secure your kubernetes uh, infrastructure is uh, and uh, you know one example would be uh, something called a sys benchmarks uh, i'm not sure if uh, this person is familiar but sys benchmarks is it actually a set of standards where it will tell you you know your let's say in, in your kubernetes uh, platform there is something called hcd or api server how these different components are uh, configured if you know someone setting up kubernetes for the first time is not familiar about these things and if you know it is given uh, privilege access you are given pseudo uh, root access to you know to everyone uh, in the organization things can just go haywire and you need some kind of a uh, you know method to <clears throat> make sure that these things are uh, secure and yeah uh, the, i hope i answered that thanks for those questions uh, and let me continue uh, so moving on we were talking about the challenges so solution is i mean how do you solve for these challenges or problems uh, we know that most of the service to service uh, uh, traffic is at the application level and uh, what calico does is i'm i'm here to talk about calico which is uh, you know the open source solution that uh, <clears throat> came out uh, maybe around 2016 just when kubernetes adoption was uh, increasing uh, this came out of you know calico is basically it started as a uh, software defined networking solution for uh, uh, open uh, trying to remember uh, i think it was open not open shift it was another uh, you know sdn uh, solution that was in the market and uh, these folks at uh, metaswitch were trying to come up with a uh, with a more elegant solution for that and uh, that's how calico started and uh, what happened from there is uh, they also designed a cni which is container networking interface uh, so cni is basically you know uh, a way to uh, provide networking for containers uh, so you know that kubernetes is orchestrating these containers it it has you know information on what the state of the uh, the application is but how do you uh, put you know how do you uh, make sure that these different uh, pods and workloads communicate with each other you need some kind of a 
a networking tool. Uh, imagine, you know, a switch or a router. You cannot obviously put some kind of a hardware switch in between or a router between. So SDN is, you know, the answer. And you you need the, the SDN for containers is usually called uh, CNI, which is the networking interface. And one of the, uh, you know, there are two primary use cases for a CNI. One is providing the networking, providing layer three, uh, networking for containers, and the other one is also handling the the IP addresses, which is in the form of IPAM, uh, IP address management uh, system. So Calico is uh, 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 started as a CNI, uh, and uh, you know started building out things like policies, where it became the default uh, policies for a lot of uh, Kubernetes uh, deployments. So Kubernetes by itself has policies by default, which is actually based on Calico. So when you install Kubernetes and if you look at uh, Kubernetes network policies, that is not, nothing but Calico that is running. So uh, that is the open source uh, version. And uh, what we do for application level observability is, uh, I mentioned uh, sidecar and you know service mesh and things like that. So let's get into that uh, piece now. Um, so we provide microservices observability using uh, Envoy. So Envoy is uh, it's it's like a proxy that sits between uh, your workload and you know the other services. So imagine that you know it's called a sidecar because it sits right next to the workload, and any type of service level communication that needs to happen with other workloads it goes through the sidecar proxy. And that's basically, you know, the uh, it brings in another control plane to the equation and uh, it just gets, you know, more complex, but, you know, that's the only way to do it. Uh, uh, so let's let's see what, what, what is happening here. Uh, so Envoy can be uh, uh, integrated with Calico to provide, uh, you know, service to level communication, but, when I say integrated, it's actually we've used Envoy to be installed in a very easy manner. And uh, if you're the, the when I say uh, it gets complicated, I'm talking about using Envoy without Calico in the picture at all. So if you if you don't have Calico, and if you want to look at service to service, service, to service communication, uh, the only way is to install uh, you know Envoy or Istio on your own and some kind of a service mesh and look at all these things, but the complexity and the problem comes when managing Istio or Envoy itself. So we have taken that uh, uh, you know challenge or problem out of the equation and made it very simple if you're using Calico. It's just you know a couple of commands and you're good to go. You'll get all these benefits that uh, are you know that we're going to see. Uh, <clears throat> So what it does is, so when you install uh, Envoy as a sidecar, what it provides is it'll provide uh, flow logs uh, for application level traffic. So all the HTTP, uh, uh, you know, metrics and uh, things that you're interested in. Uh, I don't know if this uh, screenshot is, uh, you know, large enough for people to see. Let me try. Okay. Yeah, we can see, we can see, Giri. Yeah, you can see, can okay, see. okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it has, you know, a HTTP request duration, uh, requests over time, uh, you know, all the different types of metrics. And, and also the best part about this is it'll give you information with uh, with context that is where, uh, which namespace this is coming from. So if you look at the- If you uh, want, you can focus, Giri. If you want, you can- No, 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 that's, that's okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, so if you look at uh, L7 all services, it talks about front end, cart service, currency service. You, so you can actually drill down and see which particular service is performing, uh, how it's performing and so on. Um, so uh, yeah, and the other thing is it also provides uh, uh, valuable metadata about uh, these flows. Um, so metadata is you know the data that is, uh, enriched on top of the uh, regular you know l7 data that you see uh, so that will be you know things like which pod is it coming from the 
uh, when uh, uh, which node the pod is part of and so on. Um, and I think I mentioned this before, it also <coughs> allows people to, when you use Calico, it allows people to uh, use WireGuard as an encryption technique where uh, for data and transit en encryption, you can just enable uh, WireGuard without the need to do anything. So it's automatically encrypted. All L7 traffic is encrypted when you uh, enable WireGuard. So that's another benefit. And that's how Calico is you know, uh, providing a solution for all the challenges that we looked at. <clears throat> Uh, so I think this slide is just talking about uh, all the different types of uh, flow log data that you see. Uh, you know, source and destination namespace. I think I mentioned this. The the URLs, the response code, so many you know uh, uh, fields that that can be useful while <coughs> troubleshooting. Um, yeah, so when I spoke about service mesh, uh, it actually really brings in uh, a lot of complexity because uh, I mentioned it uh, adds an another new control plane to your uh, equation. So you need to know how service mesh works. You need to understand uh, you know, how to maintain, install it, uh, upgrade it, and so on. Uh, and that is almost like having another solution on top of Kubernetes. Uh, so with Calico, what you get is the same uh, benefits of a service mesh and uh, an easier way to use some of the benefits. So, you know, the most popular uh, use cases for the service mesh will be observability and security, you know, things like encryption I spoke about. You don't need to use a service mesh for encryption because you already have WireGuard uh, enabled. Um, you need to look at uh, service service communication. You get that with, you know, Envoy is a, a sidecar model. You've already installed that with Calico, so you don't need to install a service mesh like Istio separately. So we've integrated everything within uh, Calico itself. Um, again, so I think someone asked about uh, uh, security posture, and it's you know that's also another benefit. You meet organization uh, or regulatory compliance. Uh, <clears throat> so some of the compliance requirements will be specifically around application level, application protection. So someone asked about WAF, and I uh, uh, shared some information on WAF. There is, there are. Uh, some compliance uh, <clears throat> standards which actually require you to specifically there is there, there is a line item where you have to say I have a web application firewall installed to be you know to uh, uh, pass your <coughs> compliance uh, exam so that that's another use case. Uh, let me take a pause uh, and look at some Q and A. <coughs> Um, so the first question is how to analyze flow logs. Will it not be humongous? Uh, <laughs> it will be uh, humongous. Yes, it is, it is true. But uh, again, I think I, I'm not sure what, your, uh, what uh, role you play, but <clears throat> for folks who are familiar in the security uh, uh, you know, business and if, you're, if you've used uh, solutions like an NDR or an EDR, you know, uh, network detection and response uh, solutions, or even SIMS. <clears throat> uh, it, it is a lot of data, but then the the, uh, the task for these solution providers, like you know, let's say Splunk, who's a SIM solu uh, solution provider, or uh, SOAR solution, or even you know Calico, for example, the task is to make it easier for the user to analyze things quickly. You know, it, it's not if you use Calico, or, or I'm just you know talking about all the other solutions available for different reasons. Uh, instead of taking hours and you know not hours, maybe days or weeks, uh, the idea is to bring it down to a couple of minutes or even hours. Uh, so you do have you know various uh, 
uh, features to uh, analyze flow logs in a much more easier way. And uh, that's the whole concept of coming up with solutions which can do that. Uh, and when I say um, uh, it's the task of these solution providers, what we do is uh, with Calico, you can actually look at flow logs. You can actually drill down uh, with something called service graph. We have something called dynamic service and thread graph. And what it will show is, uh, uh, visually it will show you the namespaces. The, when you start with the cluster, it will show the namespaces and different workloads. And you can actually drill down to each level up to a pod level and actually see the flow log. So it doesn't have to be you know flow logs at the cluster level where it will be like you know, maybe uh, millions of entries. So uh, that's the whole concept of uh, Calico or any, I'm sure there are other providers which do the same thing. So yeah. Uh, the second question is can a WAF uh, parenthesis CDN providers plus internal WAF plus some sort process and security log analysis and open vulnerability analysis using Splunk and Optix maybe address this issue. Uh, yeah, it can definitely address uh, the issue for uh, application level security. So that's what I've covered so far. Uh, and when you say internal WAF, uh, I'm hoping you mean the WAF that I was talking about where there is something that is installed within the cluster. So, uh, you know, one of our products uh, actually has a solution called workload centric WAF. You can actually, it's part of our offering. And uh, I, I think uh, I, I've looked at a lot of solutions like Palo Alto and, uh, you know, other big players. And uh, it's actually very hard to find something that is at the workload level. Uh, and uh, we've actually leveraged uh, an open source uh, WAF solution. Uh, let me uh, recollect what the, the name of that uh, solution is. I'll, I'll, I'll think about it. If, if it uh, crosses my mind, I'll, I'll let you know. But you're right. I mean, to address this issue, you do you can use all the combinations and multiple solutions that you've spoken about, but you know, the idea is who can provide that? Who can provide that internal WAF that we've spoken about? Uh, and uh, this is just one aspect of uh, security within containers and Kubernetes. It's not just application layer or it's not, you know, an attacker can come into your container where there is no concept of any network. He's just, you know, there is some vulnerability in your container image and uh, the attacker, he or she is, getting into the container runtime, doing something within the kernel, all this is not going to uh, you know, be detected through a WAF or a SIM or a SOAR. So I understand the question, but then there is just so many things to, a, to container security that just one solution is not going to protect you. And uh, the, the, the idea is you know, people are trying to build uh, a single, one uh, single solution which can actually do multiple things, just like a UTM. Uh, there's another question. How does the onboarding, onboarding process work to integrate Calico? Uh, if you're asking about onboarding process to install Calico or integrate Istio with Calico, so all this will be available with the doc documentation. Uh, I'll, towards the end of the session, I'll share the uh, link to the uh, Docs. In fact, let me actually just do that right now. Um, okay, and let me put it on chat. And if one of you can tell me if uh, you got that link, uh, that'll be good. <clears throat> Mo had, Mo had. Uh, Sorry? Head, yeah. Uh, I'm hearing. Yeah, yeah, I think it is there, the, it's there in the chat. Go ahead. Okay. I'm also hearing some kind of a beeping noise. 
Um, no, it's okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oops. Do you hear that too, or is it just on my end? Yeah, sometimes it's beeping. Sometimes coming in. Oh. Uh, so let, let me disconnect audio and join once. Just give me a word. <clears throat> Sorry about that. I think my keyboard was on top of the laptop. Okay, it's okay now. Yeah. Uh, okay, yeah. So, I'm, the uh, documentation uh, link. Uh, so, the onboarding process if you're talking about how to install Calico or how to install Istio or onboard with Calico, everything is in that page. You could definitely go to that and, you know. Uh, look at how things are done. Can there's another question? Can Calico data be taken into tools like Prometheus or Grafana? Uh, not with the open source, but yeah, we do have a way to. Uh, we have our own Kibana dashboards, but uh, there is uh, you know a facility to uh, export it to Prometheus and Grafana. And uh, <clears throat> I think the documentation should probably cover that. Uh, do cloud providers, the, the, uh, the, the last question, or actually one more question is, do cloud providers like AWS or Azure support Calico from their own Kubernetes management capabilities? Okay, um, yeah, they do. Um, and they do it in a very different way. Uh, you know, AWS, EKS, or Elastic Kubernetes Service for people who are not familiar. So that's a Kubernetes uh, managed service that is provided by AWS. So they do uh, offer Calico as uh, a choice of CNI or even policy. So when I say they do it differently, EKS does it in a different way. You can actually use just Calico for CNI or use Calico without a CNI and use it for security policies. Uh, with Azure, you can actually, there's a new concept called bring your own CNI where previously Azure had no option of any other CNI except their own. Uh, which is, I think, which was called Azure VPC CNI and KubeNet. And I mean, the, the interesting thing is Azure VPC uh, CNI itself was actually Calico underneath, but we, I don't know why we never promoted that. But right now they have a concept of bring your own CNI where you can actually bring Calico as a CNI. And on top of that, either without the CNI or the CNI, you can have Calico integrated with AKS. Uh, on Azure for uh, security policies. So yeah, we do we do support all major public cloud providers. Uh, we're also available on uh, Red Hat, OpenShift, Rancher. Uh, what else? Um, Google Cloud. Yeah, everything. Um, one more question: When you use the term workloads, it refers to what elemental level of granularity? A few examples. A few examples will help. Uh, Great question. Uh, it's actually, yeah, I, I think I mentioned I interchangeably use workload or pods. Uh, I mean, when, when you say workloads, it's actually uh, any unit of compute which is programmed to do a particular work. So in this case, uh, typically when you talk about Kubernetes and containers, a workload is actually a pod. So, uh, and when I say pod, it's actually, uh, you know, pod is running one or two containers within that. So you could even uh, remove that abstraction and say a container can be a workload. So uh, it's kind of a generic term, but uh, when I say workloads in this case, so imagine your application is doing multiple things. Uh, you have different services for different uh, parts of your application. And uh, when a particular, let's say uh, your retail, 
uh, application, you have a checkout service. Checkout service will have, I think, again, smaller chunks of uh, uh, software. And each piece of software can be uh, thought of as a workload. And that will ultimately be a pod. All right, so let me go back to the slide. Um, so moving on, I think we've uh, looked at all the challenges and solutions how Calico solves for this problem. Uh, I, I did mention, you know, Istio sidecars, service mesh, and so on. Let me uh, provide a little more, uh, add a little more color on what these things mean. So, uh, when you typically have an application, you build an application, you would need. I'm talking, and here I'm talking about containerized application. You would need a way to interact with the application, right? With to, you know, uh, understand the security, understand performance and observability, and so on. And you don't want to disrupt by sending in multiple requests when you know when it is in production. So you need to use some kind of a debugger, or you need to snoop traffic, uh, you snoop packets. You need to sniff out packets to look at uh, traffic. And uh, in for this uh, scenario, what uh, people did was come up with a sidecar model. I think I mentioned this, but yeah, sidecar model is basically it puts a proxy in front of your worker mode. Again, I'm bringing another term here. Worker mode is uh, a Kubernetes specific term where uh, it's nothing but you know nodes that participate in the application. So that, that's all a worker mode uh, is. So you have you know a kind of uh, you have a proxy in front of these nodes so that any communication that uh, goes outside goes through this proxy and uh, you know, all these features and functionality around observability and security that you need is taken out of this proxy and used. So it kind of becomes a gateway for application. Um, and Calico, like I said, we integrate seamlessly with Istio, to enforce uh, layer seven uh, network policy within the Istio service mesh. <clears throat> um, so I think someone asked about policy implementation. So, and that's how, that's where it goes. So we provide, Calico is known for its network policy implementation uh, at a much more granular level than, than basic uh, Kubernetes policies. And what you can do is add, uh, so these policies usually work at layer three or four. And with the Istio integration, you can actually add application layer attributes like HTTP methods, put or get those things, or even you can include uh, actual URL paths in your uh, policies. And that's basically how you do it. Um, and what, what it means by pod injection is uh, these two annotations that are shown here, you know, istio injection equal enable and sidecar istio.io slash inject equal to true. We use these two annotations and uh, you can let the Istio pod injector know which workloads require on work proxy. You basically use this during you know uh, implementation of the uh, application layer. Uh, you know implementing uh, integrating Istio with Calico. Uh, so to do this, we need to install Istio and configure Envoy. But once you do that, it's simple. You know, couple of commands after this. <clears throat> So any pod with these labels, when you uh, have any pods with the following labels, it will be added to the service mesh. All right. Um, and we also spoke about Istio. Uh, if you're not familiar with Istio, it's, it's basically you know the most common service mesh that is out uh, out there, and. Uh, uh, when I say service mesh, it's you know any anything that is used to describe the network of microservices that make up applications and any type of interaction that goes on within them. So that is basically a service mesh. Uh, so some the a service mesh uh, like the open source plug Istio is also open source, and uh, it's it's you know think about service mesh as a way to control how different parts of an application share data with one another. Uh, 
trying to come up with an example, but anyway. Uh, uh, so it's a dedicated infrastructure layer uh, built right into the application. And like I said, it's usually uh, implemented as a sidecar proxy and traffic flows through this sidecar proxy and you can you know, have all types of controls with traffic management and security. Uh, and since it controls you know, any ingress and egress traffic to the services, you can uh, extract information using the service mesh. Uh, if there's a HTTP call, uh, you can figure it out and you can send it for monitoring. Uh, you can find out who's using SSL, who's sharing SSL certs to see or use uh, SSL certificate to see inside the traffic. <clears throat> Uh, picture time. Okay, so uh, this is another you know representation of what uh, a service mesh architecture typically looks like. Um, so I mentioned it introduces a new control plane, and uh, when you you know uh, look at this diagram, what you can see is uh, the service mesh will let proxies to discover applications. Uh, so you see service B and service D, and there is a proxy <clears throat> sitting in right in front of it. Um, and this is where you apply uh, uh, the application layer policies to control ingress or egress traffic. Um, so for instance, if, you know, let's say there is a website, you have mysite.com, and you have a URL specifically within that saying mysite.com slash do not enter. You don't want anyone to enter. There's no way for you to deny access to this URL unless you change some you know, server config or mm -hmm. disabling the network. But with service mesh, what you can do is tap into layer seven and write a policy for that particular URL so that you either block ingress or egress uh, traffic to this URL. Um, it can understand layer seven, it can understand the whole packet and it can help to disable that particular URL. You don't have to modify your code. You don't have to go into the application. You don't have to change anything on your network for this to happen. <laughs> um, yeah, and as I mentioned, we, we have a seamless integration with any uh, service mesh. Um, and especially for Istio, it lets you enforce uh, application layer attributes like HTTP methods uh, and path. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, and some of the benefits for uh, uh, of doing this, you know, integration with Istio is you can uh, control traffic at the pod level. Uh, <clears throat> it'll restrict ingress traffic inside and outside pods, and you know, mitigate common threats to Istio enabled apps. Uh, you get a, uh, you can adopt a zero trust network model for security, uh, including traffic encryption, which is you know, uh, probably another requirement for compliance. Uh, it'll give you multiple, multiple enforcement points and also multiple identity criteria for authentication. <clears throat> and the last benefit is, you know, it's a familiar policy language. Once you install Calico and you're using Calico for network policies, you don't have to learn a new type of policy language to control application layer, uh, uh, you know, traffic. Okay. Or you don't even need to know how Istio works. Uh, so with Calico integration, what uh, there are two levels. So one is, let me actually uh, pause again and see if there are any questions. Um, I don't know how many. All right, so uh, when you look at Calico integration, uh, you, there are two uh, types. One is Calico network policy and the second is Calico global network policy. And the difference is, I remember I mentioned about namespaces. Uh, so Calico network <coughs> policy is actually uh, namespace level. So you can enforce restrictions or exceptions within a namespace. Uh, and what global network policy does is for the entire cluster, you can enforce a policy or rule for the entire cluster as a whole. So you can add, uh, so when you're writing your Calico policies, you can 
uh, add these HTTP sections where you can either mm -hmm. uh, mention if it's a get or a put, and also an option is to provide an actual path for uh, adding these restrictions. <clears throat> Um, next slide is actually, um, I don't know if I want to get into details, but this is you know, the high level architecture diagram of how Calico is designed to understand. Uh, I mean, Calico, not just Calico as a whole, but Calico with Envoy as a sidecar model. Uh, this is how it's designed. Uh, so you see something called Felix. Uh, so Felix is the brain of Calico and it's the control plane portion that lets underlying infrastructure know that, uh, you know, this a particular traffic is allowed or not allowed. So let's say when you create a Calico policy, uh, what happens is it goes to Felix and depending on how many nodes, Felix will, uh, uh, is inside the Calico uh, node daemon set. Uh, so depending on the data plane, if it's eBPF or uh, you know standard Linux, it'll create either IP tables or eBPF programs to you know limit or permit whatever you're trying to write. Uh, there is no mention of eBPF here on this slide, but if you're if you're interested, if you want to know more about eBPF, I would encourage you to again, uh, you know, just maybe start to Google and read about it so it's a it's a it's a very interesting way to uh, 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 get to the kernel level of any uh, system any uh, uh, application and without disturbing you know the application itself you can actually get a lot of things done you can actually create a sandbox environment you can write your own programs to get kernel level details and you know, it's, it's, it's the adoption and usage has just exploded. Uh, people are going crazy about eBPF adoption in the container space. So I would I would suggest uh, uh, doing a little more, you know, reading on your own about eBPF. So yeah, so it's, it's actually a data plane concept. So you either have eBPF or standard Linux. And uh, what Felix, Felix will do is tell uh, Decaster is to inform the proxy. So you see Envoy that is sitting right next to the workload uh, to uh, it'll inform the proxy on the decision to make, you know, either um, let the traffic go through or drop the traffic or block the traffic. <clears throat> um, so yeah, that's about, uh, you know, the, the architecture of how a Calico policy works with uh, Envoy. Uh, for application here. So this is how internally the uh, policy flow happens. <clears throat> um, I think I, I don't have anything else to share with respect to the topic, but uh, I'll just you know, briefly talk about what Project Calico is. So I mentioned already it's, the, it's an open source project and we've uh, you know, had, had a huge adoption rate uh, with a uh, lot of companies using it. Um, uh, it's a very active community. So you could, if, you, if you're on Slack, you could join the channel. You, if you're on Twitter or LinkedIn, you can follow Project Calico. Uh, it's, I mean, this community talks about cloud networking and security. And if you, if you're having any, you know, issues or uh, problems with using Calico, you can ask people on the community. And so we have about eight thousand Slack members, you know, the channel members, and about. Uh, I think roughly, so this one says 320, it's not updated. I think right now, currently we have about 500 active uh, contributors to the project. So I'm sure you all know how open source uh, projects work. And uh, I mean, just the fact that Calico is actually currently running on 2 million nodes is, you know, a testament to the fact that it's, it's one of the most widely used uh, security and networking solutions for containers. Um, so, it's, so it's a community behind a pure layer three approach to virtual networking and security. Uh, it's used in highly scalable <coughs> data centers. Um, you can also use Calico for you know, VMs and native host-based workloads. It's not just for containers. Uh, like I said, it's 
it's, a, it's an SDN. And it also supports multiple architectures and platforms. Uh, and I already mentioned the different uh, public cloud vendors and private, sorry, private cloud vendors that can support Calico. And it's also, you know, the best part about uh, this is uh, it's designed to be modular. So we have something called a pluggable data plane. Uh, and I just mentioned or spoke about eBPF and Linux. So we support any type of data plane. It doesn't matter if you're running eBPF workloads or Linux or even Windows. Uh, there's something called HNS or host network service for Windows environments. So Calico will work on any type of uh, data plane. And in the future, if there is a new data plane that's coming out, which is you know faster, uh, better, stronger, I, I, with with our uh, architecture, we can easily integrate to that. Um, I don't know if you're able to look at, yeah, okay. Um, I think I mentioned about, uh, yeah, the eBPF data planes and post network service data planes. Um, and, you know, uh, just looking at this slide, Calico opens to some of the benefits, you know, choice of data plane, you get, uh, it's a pluggable data plane model. And also for performance, uh, there's been, you know, a lot of uh, studies and, uh, uh, articles written by uh, some community members who have tested Calico with other solutions uh, and found out that, you know, <clears throat> for different uh, benchmark uh, studies, Calico has come out with uh, flight colors uh, with respect to, you know, CPU usage and cost. Um, and of course, I mentioned about the <clears throat> uh, different types of workloads, and it's also exceptionally scalable. Uh, did I mention we do layer three networking? So basically the, the uh, protocol behind it is BGP and you know BGP powers the entire internet. So if BGP can handle internet, Calico can handle the internet too. So, uh, <clears throat> uh, so when it comes to Kubernetes itself, uh, it's a Kubernetes native security policy model. So it's declarative in nature. You don't need to understand Calico as a, totally different solution. Uh, if you are familiar with how Kubernetes, uh, uh, you know, declaration, all these, you know, the different YAML and uh, uh, deployments work, it's it's a unified model. You can easily understand Calico. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Yeah. You want, you want to run uh, Q&A? Sure, yeah. Um, is there any security implement at service level to a proxy? So how is security issues taken uh, So yes, really, I think the service mesh itself, uh, I'm sorry if you are hearing background noise, she just started to cry now, so sorry about that. Um, so the whole concept of service mesh itself is to actually implement security controls and uh, the problem also with that is how you uh, configure and use a service mesh. So uh, there is implementation at the service level itself. Uh, uh, but to understand how that works, I think you need to understand how service mesh works. You need to install Istio apart from Calico on, on, on your own and do it. So, yeah. Uh, so the next question is how is this product different from a CNAP? Uh, so CNAP is, uh, if, if uh, people are not familiar with that term, it's uh, it's a Gartner term, uh, uh, which stands for Cloud Native Application Protection Platform. So, uh, I mean, it's just another way of uh, talking about one solution which can do multiple things. So when you say CNAP, uh, uh, and when, it, when you say cloud native, there are so many, so most cloud native applications are built with containers. And with container security, as I mentioned before, you don't, you cannot say that, you know, taking care of security with just installing Calico open source or just installing, you know, a scene. So it's it's a whole uh, a range of problems that you can look at from a security standpoint, uh, all the way from build time to runtime. There are so many, you know, threats that can, uh, occur during build time and runtime. So let's say you're 
you know, tasked with uh, deploying a container. Uh, I mean, deploying an application with containers. So you take this, you know, base image, uh, put different layers on top, add extensions and libraries, and uh, <clears throat> use a container runtime to uh, uh, make it a container. So a CNAP's uh, task is to make sure that all these uh, stages like build, deploy, and runtime, you have some kind of a solution, uh, security solution that takes care of the entire CIC lifecycle. Uh, so Calico open source itself cannot be a CNAP because it doesn't uh, offer all the capabilities, but our you know, uh, commercial offerings do uh, you know, much more than what Calico uh, open source can do. Uh, so that that is a scene. <clears throat> um, so with Calico open source, what you get is security policies and the scene up is much more than just security policies. Um, can Calico log any changes to containers nodes if I make any changes in its production environment? How is that a stack? Uh, Calico log. I'm not sure if I understand this question, <clears throat> but um, so I think uh, if you're talking about uh, changes that you're making within Calico itself, if you can track these, yes, you can. But let me read the question again. Can Calico log any changes to containers nodes if I make any changes in its production environment? Uh, so, I, okay, if you're changing any parameters within containers, can Calico track this? I don't think uh, it can track everything and anything. Uh, anything to do with, uh, you know, if, if you're talking about the data plane, if you're talking about traffic, with network and security uh, policies, yes, it can track, but depending on what you're asking, I mean, if it's something to do with the application itself, I don't think it can track everything. I don't think any solution can track everything what's happening within the production environment, but I'm sorry, I'm not 100% uh, sure on what that question means. Uh, if I but the answer but, is uh, yes, yeah, it's uh, changes can be tracked, not all, but yeah, some part, including the networking, yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, again, uh, brand slide uh, to uh, show how popular we are. Uh, Calico is running on 2 million nodes and we have about 1 billion Docker tools and it's running on about 50,000 enterprises globally. So, um, um, can, you, can you run that, uh, uh, the poll and do uh, a day? Question. I can run. I can. Yes. Yeah, so launch. Oh, okay. Now. Okay. So, yeah. You can see. I can see it. Yeah. Probably you can explain this. Yeah. yeah. So should I wait for people to answer? Yeah. I think yeah. 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 You can wait. Yeah. Are yeah. Okay. One minute. Oh, they, the participants won't be able to see the answers, right? Respond. They will be able to. They will be able to. Yeah. Oh, they 